Hello friends, Adam here with FED. So the trailer for Fire Emblem Engage was obviously from some weird build of the game. Like seriously, why was that Pegasus lady dealing like 42 damage per attack and then had that really fat critical attack? It's a little off, a little odd. I doubt you have an early game Pegasus Knight that deals 42 damage to, to you know, Axe Fighter dudes. That's kind of a lot, kind of insane. So it's probably some weird build. So everything is completely and totally subject to change. So everything that we talk about today could just totally be off. That being said, we're going to break down this trailer shot by shot. We're going super deep in on the gameplay. We're going to figure out what makes this game tick. And we're going to make some predictions as well for things that we don't necessarily get to see or get to know for sure. But before we get into it, please consider subscribing. We have a goal of hitting 25,000 subs by the end of the year which I know is a big goal. We're pretty far away from it, but we still have a few months to make it happen. So any help with that would be appreciated. So please subscribe and share this video with your friends. That would mean a lot to me. Anyways, let's get into it. So first, movement seems pretty similar to three houses, with infantry being low at four, and then your cavaliers only had five, but with the emblem ring attached, uh, we saw that Alfred did get up to six, which does fall in line with early game three houses. So I'm sure that will increase again with emblem rings and probably promotion and maybe even some items along the way like is traditional in Fire Emblem. The weapon triangle is obviously back. There is an obvious up arrow or down arrow in the battle forecast depending on which side of it you fall the advantage or the disadvantage. We also see on the map that there are the colored icons that relate to certain weapons similar to how it is in Fire Emblem Heroes. To note with that as well really quick. There's also some gray weapons that probably just fall outside of the weapon triangle entirely. You know, you saw the bow was gray. Uh, there's probably also like the, the full body art or iron body art or whatever it's called. It's probably gray as well. So, yeah. Also, weapon durability doesn't seem to be present. Uh, I didn't see it uh, listed anywhere. So similar to Fates and Echoes, weapon durability might just not exist. The iron body art weapon is most likely just gauntlets from three houses. Other attacks have damage listed separately in battle, but we see that the person using the the, the iron body art uh, from a or, or frame or from, I'm not really good at pronouncing names, so forgive me. Uh, for May, maybe uh, had a, it said six times two rather than having six and six displayed, probably indicating a brave effect, right, where the two attacks happen consecutively. So. Iron body art, or maybe they'll probably be steel body art, silver body art. The body art weapon type is probably just gauntlets from three houses by another name. Breaks seem really interesting. They seem to be a debuffing skill similar to seal skills and fates in three houses. And looking at every time a break attack happens is when the attacking unit has a weapon triangle advantage. Now this is obviously an incredibly small sample size, but that probably has something to do with whether a break can happen or not. However, there is a moment later when Alir and Marth are engaged, you know, they, they form together, uh, and a break doesn't happen even though they're fighting a, with a sword against an axe bro, which again, that would be weapon triangle advantage. This could mean that breaks are tied to a skill that is only activated against certain weapon types. So breaks are probably debuffs of some kind that are tied to not just uh, an activation condition, but a skill as well, right? Uh, because we do see that Marth, when engaged with someone, or not engaged, but when uh, paired up with a character, gives the skill uh, defense break or break defense. So it's probably something along those lines. But what else does break do? I think break has uh, a lot more to it than we'll probably have any way to really know until they talk about it. But when a break occurs, the enemy gets knocked over as if they were killed. They even drop their weapons, right? But they clearly didn't die as they still have HP left. And at the very end of the clip where Alfred used break on a sword fighter, he quickly got back up. It's really quick. It's like the last couple frames of the shot. But you can definitely see that that sword fighter quickly shoots back to his feet. Now, this is just a guess, but a break may cause an enemy to lose their ability to attack. Or maybe in the case of the sword fighter who is going to retaliate with a double attack, might just lose out on their first attack in that combat. So a break may just mitigate attacks from the enemy, right? That's back. I actually think that'd be pretty cool and I'd be really into that. If it was done well and if the enemy also has access to that. Just something for them to work with too, you know? 
Uh, effective weaponry is definitely here. Chloe fights a guy with a hammer, which have historically been effective against armor knights, so there's that. We also see Alfred later when he is engaged with Sigurd using a Rider's Bane, which is, again, traditionally effective against cal Cavaliers, so that's probably a thing. We also see an archer, uh, Eti, or Etai, I don't, I don't know how to say her name. She does massive damage to a flyer, so most likely that's like effective damage, right? But again, it's really hard to tell because this is this the damage numbers are all weird in this build here. Uh, critical attacks are, are still triple damage. That's pretty much confirmed at this point now, so that's nice. And it's been like that for a long time, ever since uh, you know FE5 or post FE5, I should say. It appears that anyone can put on any emblem ring, but they will get extra skills from being a similar type of unit to that emblem. So Marth gives Alir two type bonus abilities, Divine Speed and Lodestar Rush. Those extra skills probably come into effect when an engagement happens, which I will talk about in a sec. Based on what we see from Alfred and Sigurd, who has Override, some of these abilities are likely combat arts that can be used for some kind of cost. We don't see what kind of cost that might be, but we do see uh, something along those lines later when uh, Selene and Selica are engaged. Now, Alfred and Sigurd do use a skill called Momentum, and it pops up when Alfred and Sigurd attack a sword dude. Uh, it also is a it seems to be a break skill to me. Uh, it has a similar coloring to the, the break defense skill that we see on Marth. It has a different icon, though, like it has a guy running instead of a sword, right? So maybe momentum causes a break when using your full movement. It could also be that momentum just deals extra damage or something upon using your full movement or using most of your movement or something along those lines. But I think that would actually be a really cool thing if we have these break skills that have different conditions other than just, oh, use a sword against an axe you get the break but if it's like oh you're a cavalier with a spear so it makes sense that if you're running you would deal more damage so or like you would break them break through them or something so you use your full move and you break them that could be cool and i hope that's the case but again it's impossible to know at this point also talking about momentum it's hard to say where that skill came from but i have a pretty good guess if you look at the emblem ring screen sigurd gives a canter gallop and override in the next portion of the trailer, there are two additional skills that are grouped with the other Sigurd skills. So what's the difference? On the Emblem Rings selection screen, they have a bond level of 1, but on the map, it says they have a bond level of 10. So it would seem that using the same ring over and over will earn new abilities and combat arts, essentially leveling up the ring with that character. It reminds me a lot of Fire Emblem Echo Shadows of Valentia, how you learned combat arts and stuff through skill, but through use and skills through using items uh, frequently, right? So like if you use the Iron Sword over and over and over again, you eventually master using that sword or so, and you get like Wrath Strike or whatever it is. Uh, I think that's kind of how it's going to work here. There, are, there might also be more to that, but I, I with like forging or, or something, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Also, the stat gains from an emblem ring seem tied to bond level uh, as well, not just their skills. Marth gives a much larger amount of buffs than Sigurd does, but Marth and Alir have a bond level of 6 listed on that screen, while Alfred and Sigurd only have a, a shown level of 1 here. I doubt that Marth gives that much more power naturally over Sigurd, so there may be some other things in play here. Uh, that go along with enhancing your ring, but more off, more likely than not, it's just about increasing your bond in that sense. Now, I don't know if anyone's actually excited for this, but I don't think I am. The monastery, the monastery is back. It's not the monastery. It has, it goes by obviously it'll go by a different name because it's not a classroom setting, but it's there. We have an exploration my castle kind of thing like fates, except you know 3D and all that. Also, side thing. Floating islands exist. I like floating islands. I don't know. Ever since I played Chrono Trigger, I just kind of thought it was a cool aesthetic. So yeah, floating islands are cool. So this base area looks to be as tedious as ever, but hopefully they will add some fast travel that works really well. Like it's just really quick and snappy. Because like, that's the problem with three houses that the fast travel wasn't like it, the load screens just took forever. Or better yet, just give us menus to work with a la Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn. That would solve all the problems. 
we get to see a day and a night, which implies some sort of cycle there. It would be cool if they applied the limited weekend time from three houses in a more literal sense. Like instead of activity points where you can only do, you know, anywhere between three and ten activities on a weekend, you're given five minutes, so like a time limit, to get as much stuff as done possible, after which it will be night time and activities will cease to be available. I think that could be really cool and would add a, a an element of skill and, and and fast menuing and stuff like that to the the, the exploration segments. I think that could work really well. Kind of hope that happens. I doubt it, but it'd be cool. There is a there is a shop shown in the trailer. Nothing crazy though. Nothing to really talk about there. Oddly enough, there's a moment in the trailer where it focuses on some livestock looking, you know, animals and stuff. Uh, it looks like there's a chicken with a speech bubble. It might not be a chicken, some other bird, but it has like a little speech bubble above its head. So like, will Alir be able to talk to animals because they're a dragon? <laughs> also, will this game turn into a farming simulator? Oh, I hope not. But in that same shot, there's also some sparkles that are there. It's probably just some items to be picked up. Like you saw in Garrick Mach Monastery, they're like the blue glowies that you would click on them and you either get experience for your professor rank or you get some, some random item uh, or it could indicate some sort of special animal in the farming area for a brief second it kind of looks like those sparkles may be coming from some sort of animal back there again i don't think this is the case and i really hope it's not but who knows uh engage could have some sort of farming aspects to it again kind of hope it doesn't but we'll see all right uh, Kalni or Kalne, the blacksmith, thanks Alir for allowing them to open up shop at their base, which is called Sumniel, by the way, based on the button commands at the top of the screen. Uh, the smithy saying this might imply that recruiting units will have benefits besides just, you know, gaining units to fight with. Similar to Suikoden, recruiting characters might also allow them to be useful outside of combat, like by opening special shops and whatnot. Uh, the, nar the narration at this point also says that recruiting more allies will liven the base up. So, more likely than that, probably, I doubt you're going to recruit people that specifically just do, like, oh, they come and open a shop and that's all they do. It's more likely that adding people to your army will just mean they have other jobs at the base as well that they could do. Uh, we see that with Alfred later. He's kind of at a vendor stall looking thing. It might be something different. Maybe it's like a library or something. But Alfred is definitely seen behind some sort of table or desk standing there. That could be an indication that your the units you recruit won't just have use in battle. It may be use in the base as well. Anyways, besides the point. The blacksmith seems to be lacking a traditional anvil and blacksmith setup in general. Like you don't see it. There, there are like hammers and like little tools here and there, but you don't see like a, like a anvil or like a fire, you know, like a, something like that. Instead, there are books and like raw materials laying around. This leads me to believe that the smithing is more about upgrading your emblem rings. So I think it's less about like, Oh, let me take your sword and pound on it with some material stuff and turn it into a steel sword from an iron sword. I think it's going to be about upgrading your emblem rings. Where, uh, so I think a lot of the crafting or weapon upgrading is going to be through that rather than being uh, about just finding better weapons. Which uh, could be cool. An, an emphasis on these emblem rings is probably, you know, it's, it's what's going to make this game unique. So I hope they really lean into it that way. <clears throat> This also makes me think that uh, usable weapons come from rings as well, maybe. Like, even just, like, your iron sword or something. That'd be very that'd be very Xenoblade, you know, like, they're all blades. Probably not. I'm sure there's some basic weapons that you just have. But that'd be kind of cool. And also, it makes me think that maybe emblem rings are enhanced by putting, like, some sort of gemstones in your weapon or some other equipable. Kind of like in, like, Xenoblade 3 or something like that. It would be cool. But, but again, it, it, impossible to say. That's just conjecture. Outfits and accessories are back. They don't seem to upgrade the units in any way, but worth mentioning, they are there. And who knows, maybe they will end up upgrading your unit in some way, giving you some small buffs here or there. All right, now let's get into some more meaty stuff. Emblem engagements, or at least that's what I choose to call them. <laughs> the unit and the emblem from the ring can combine to become a powered up unit. When Alir and Marth merge, they use Mercurius, 
which was a sword exclusive to Martha and Effie 1, but was later changed to be usable by anyone with a high enough weapon level in swords. In a later scene, Alfred is merged with Sigurd. He is using Rider's Bane, and, but, and looking back at the Emblem Ring menu, this makes sense because Sigurd is shown with the Rider's Bane as kind of his weapon of choice or whatever listed next to his skills. But if we look back at the, the Emblem Ring menu for Marth, he has a Rapier listed there in that spot, but is using Mercurius when they merge. This would imply some sort of weapon progression for the Emblem Rings. Maybe they gain more powerful weapons as their bond levels go up, or this more likely, in my mind, is tied to forging at the blacksmith shop in some way. If you look at the damage numbers here, there are three listed, 10, 21, and 21 again. The 21s manifest themselves in normal attacks, but where does that 10 come from? We do see this earlier to some extent, but you only see one attack there as well, so you don't get to see that extra damage number. So there are two options here in my mind. First, the displayed damage goes from inside out in terms of ordering. So it just go 21, 21, then 10. So the enemy just died before the 10 damage could be used in some way. However, I feel it's more likely that the attack has some sort of skill activation that dealt damage before the attack. Uh, I think this for two reasons. Number one, the enemy doesn't have any counter attack possibility here. Those aren't zeros by hit damage and crit. Those are dashes that indicate a lack of attack in general. I think the skill Skill activation had a wind sweep effect, so no counter attack. Also, thinking about it, the lack of counter could be tied to being hit with a break skill earlier in the turn, but I digress. Number two, we see Alfred use Override while fused with Sigurd, which deals damage on the map rather than in battle. So these two things together make me think that 10 da- that- <clears throat> Those two things together make me think that the 10 damage is dealt outside of battle. There's no real way to know for sure because we just aren't shown anything with the 10. So it's just a guess, but that's just kind of the thinking I, I have going on. Also, going back a bit, it would seem that there are certain skills that can be only be used when engaged with an emblem. If you look closely, it would appear that the skills Divine Speed and Lodestar are darkened. You can see the same thing with Override on Alfred and Sigurd. It is darkened, but they are shown using it after they fuse. So engaging seems to unlock some uh, powerful combat arts and skills uh, that otherwise can't be used. The final engage we see in action is Selene and Celica, who have a bond of 10. They use Warp and Ragnarok together. The Warp allows them to warp within two spaces of an enemy. It doesn't look like it has a limit, but it probably does because that'd be kind of broken. We also see that Selene has an iron sword equipped, but uses a magic attack. I'm thinking we're getting an Echo Styles magic system because of this. We even see Ragnarok have an HP cost in the battle forecast window. It says Selene will take one damage to deal 36 with the, uh, with the arrow in the middle of the forecast. That's a pretty light cost for so much power, but that might be because it's a really powerful just engagement attack. We do get to see Micaiah engage with some character on the map, but she doesn't do anything. We also do see Roy is with somebody as well. So those are two other confirmed emblems uh, in the game. Also, it would seem that emblems have some sort of life bar or energy that can be burned through. If you look at the little icons by the unit's HP bar on the map, you can clearly see what looks like a stamina bar in a circle around the portrait of the emblem. If you look closely, some appear to be gray out, implying that they act as some sort of energy that once depleted will cause them to lose power of some kind. Okay, now let's go back and talk about some smaller topics from earlier in the trailer. The class and weapon system are either very open or are limited with a lot of hybrid magic and physical classes. If we look at an opening scene from A, or from A the girl in pink is clearly holding a healing staff but is later seen using the iron body art weapon, so a punchy healer. Selene is also wielding a sword using magic and has a staff icon on the map. So likely we have an either very open weapon system and class system, or it's restricted with a lot of hyper classes. Either way, could be fun. So the boy that was with from a is most likely your early game mage your merrick bowie soren type of guy and vander is clearly your old man veteran knight guide man who will act as this game's jagan 
Like, he really should get a Jagan, Marcus, or, or Titania emblem ring. And if he doesn't, I'm going to be a little sad. Risen are basically back in the form of the Corrupted. Faceless enemies who are basically just normal classes and stuff, but you don't have to feel bad about killing because they're monsters. So, those are a thing. Now, let, let's talk about stats. I, I realize I kind of skipped over this earlier because it didn't feel like a good flow. But... Uh, the basis stats from Three Houses Return, you know, they even kept the dexterity change instead of going back to calling it skill. However, there is a returning stat from older games in the series. Build. Or at least that's what I assume BLD stands for. It being listed so high in the UI makes me think it is more important than it has ever been. I don't know how though. Maybe we'll just factor into weapon weight mitigation for your attack speed, or it could imply the return of rescue and shove as a universal mechanic, like in the Tellius game. It is listed next to SP, which could be an indication that it has something to do with the skills you can equip. Like, every skill has a certain amount of build that must be allocated to it. And that assumes that SP is similar to the same stat from Heroes, where it will allow you to obtain and upgrade skills. It could also, I could also see it being some sort of MP system uh, for as far as SP goes, but it's more likely the former example. Now let's take a look at some map things. There are these blue circles on the map in multiple places. At first glance, I thought these might be save points, but upon further viewings, there are too many of them for that to be the case. However, they appear to be more like dragon veins from Fates. They are just placed too specifically for me to assume they are random items on the ground to be picked up, like in Three Houses or Awakening. I'm not saying they are going to act just like Dragon Fanes, but that they may be points of interest that do things like open doors, lower bridges, or fire off special attacks like the rocks from Tellius games, or the acid rain stuff from Fates. I think this is pretty apparent on the map here, where it has all the hallmarks of a defense map with breakable barricades and siege weapons for the player to access and glowing tiles at the top of the map that are probably the spaces that need to be defended. Those blue spots could totally be used to raise bridges or close doors to, to slow down enemies. Other map things, I already mentioned the barricades that look breakable. We also see the big trebuchet looking thing that has 10 shots uh, with it. Aggro lines return. I love aggro lines in three houses and they are a much needed and welcome thing to stay in the series. I'm glad they're here and engage. It would seem that this game will have a dancer. The girl with the, the blue, yellow, and like pink orb th outfit things uh, attacks with a lance and then does some spin on it in the trailer, indicating a very like flowy, bouncy, dancey battle style, right? And her outfit is also fairly reminiscent of what like a dancer may wear. So yeah, I think dan the dancer's probably back and it's probably this mystery character that we don't know anything about yet. The red-haired dude is most likely the guy attached to the Roy emblem ring, if I had to guess. We know that this one, Alfred, is tied to Sigurd in some way. If I had to guess, this lady is probably going to get someone like Tharja. <laughs> but actually, I'm not sure. Selica looks claimed by Selene, and Micaiah is potentially tied to the mage boy, who uh, is there when Alir wakes up. The only other main characters that are shown in the wheel at the beginning that use magic are Corin, Byleth, Leaf, and I guess Lucina could if she has the right mother. My guess would probably go to Corrin though, especially since they aren't holding a weapon in the wheel art. However, they're holding a dragon stone, so really who knows. Also, weapon type might not even matter in this regard. Sigurd is clearly wielding a sword when he's paired with Alfred, who uses lances. But if you do look at the that wheel art at the beginning of the trailer, Sigurd is holding a lance uh, there. So that may be an indication of who these characters, who these emblems will be tied to. But again, it's just a guess, so who really knows? This also isn't to say that other characters can't use whatever ring they want, but it is clear that some characters will have better bonds with some emblems due to unit typing, and probably for, for some story and plot reasons. Okay, that was a lot, I know. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the breakdown. I really enjoyed watching, I watched the trailer so many times and like looked closely in tons of screenshots to get an idea for what's going on. Uh, so I, I really enjoyed it. Please make sure to share your thoughts in the comments. What do you think and what did I miss? What are some things that you saw? I would love to hear what you have to say. Also, please subscribe. Help us reach 25,000 subscribers before the end of the year. It would mean a lot. So, and like the video, share it with your friends. That would be awesome. Again, thanks for watching guys and I'll catch you next time.